Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Edinburgh International Book Festival. My name is Rosemary Burnett, and I'm delighted to be chairing this event today with uh, Leila Abu, Abu Leila and Alessandro Gallense. Um, Leila was born in Cairo and grew up in Khartoum. All three of her previous novels uh, were long listed for the Orange Prize. Lyrics Alley won Novel of the Year at the Scottish Book Awards and was shortlisted for the Commonwealth Writers' Prize, um, while her collection of short fiction won the Kane Prize. And do you still live in Aberdeen? Yes. yes. <laughs> she lives in Aberdeen. Alessandro Gaienzi is the founder of Hesperus Press, Alma Books and One World Classics, and the successor of John Calder at the helm of Calder Publica Publications. As well as being a literary publisher with almost 10 years of experience, he is a prize-winning translator, a poet, a playwright and a novelist. His collection of poetry, Modern Bestiary, Ars Poet, Poetastrica was published in 2005 to critical acclaim. And we're here today to talk about Leila's book, The Kindness of Enemies, and Alessandro's book, The Tower. So please, could you welcome them to the Edinburgh Book Festival? Now, I've been asked to say that the acoustics in this tent are notoriously bad because the tour buses seem to go round and round Charlotte Square for some unknown reason. So if you have any trouble hearing, please put your hand up and we'll endeavour to speak louder. Um, we're going to start off with Leila reading uh, a little bit from her book, um, The Kindness of Enemies. Do you want to just set the reading in context? Uh... Yeah. Um, can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, my novel is um, is set between um, um, present day Scotland and uh, 19th century uh, Russia, and uh, in the present day uh, Scotland, uh, Natasha, who's an academic, is um, is re researching the the life of uh, Imam Shamil who united the tribes of the Caucasus to fight against uh, Russian imperial expansion. And um, in, in this part that I'm going to read out, uh, Natasha to, to, to visit him and his mother at home, and she gets uh, stuck there because of the snow, because this is uh, the winter of 2010, if, if you remember. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot of snow in, uh, in Scotland. So um, this is uh, actually in the, in, the, in the morning, the following morning. And the name of the student is um, is uh, Oz, which is uh, his chosen name for Osama. Actually, his real name is Osama, but he doesn't like to, to use that. So this is uh, Oz uh, speaking to Natasha while they're having breakfast. So he says, um, I'm researching the types of weapons used in jihad. My thesis is that they reflect the technology of their time and are often the same as those used by the enemy. I chewed on my toast. Well, that makes sense. He said, but it violates some of the Sharia's rules, rules which have been conveniently forgotten, such as not using fire because it is only Allah's prerogative to burn sinners in hell. No human being should use fire on another human being. I saw charging horsemen wielding swords. They galloped towards enemy lines of cannons. One by one, they were shot and they slid off their horses. Would you look at what I've already written and give me feedback, he was saying. Sure, email it to me. I started telling Oz of a Russian film I had seen. It depicted Shamo's battles and the camera was angled behind the cannons facing the charging mountaineers. Like cowboy, cowboys and Indians, said Oz, and made me laugh. But he was not so off point. The comparison has been made before by sympathetic historians. The Caucasus represented as Russia's wild west, Shamil the noble savage, as magnific magnificent and inscrutable as a native American chief. Not shy of sounding abrupt, Oz asked, why are you so interested in Shamil? From a purely secular perspective, I said, he was one of the most successful rebels of the colonial age. Why do you have to say from a purely secular perspective? I paused, momentarily caught out, 
I put down my piece of toast. Do you assume that I'm religious and so you want to distance yourself from me? I did not want to distance myself from him. I shook my head. You're different from the other lecturers, he went on. A Muslim talks to them and they put on that wide-eyed, tolerant look, quick little nods, and inside they're congratulating themselves, thinking, look at me, I'm truly broad-minded, listening to all this shit and not batting an eyelid, whereas you're the opposite. You pretend that you're sarcastic, but deep down you have respect, am I right? He was like his mother, wanting me to talk about myself, but I was not ready to answer his question. I concentrated on chewing toast and finishing my tea. Then to break the silence, I said, here is something about me that is odd. I dream of historical figures. I've dreamt of Stalin and Rasputin. He smiled, it's because you were reading about them but I've never dreamt of Shaman. Not everyone can dream of Imam Shaman, he said a little coolly. Why not? Is he a prophet? No, but people like him don't just pop up in anyone's dream, only in those who've achieved a certain spiritual level. He made it sound like a video game. I decided to humor him. Has Shaman ever visited you in a dream? He looked at me as if to test whether I was teasing him or not. I kept a straight face. No, Oz said. I have often the wish that I lived in his time, to fight with him. This was one of the leading questions. Without meaning to, I found myself asking him one of the questions the trainer suggested we put to our students. I hadn't intended to test if Oz was vulnerable to radicalization, but the question presented itself now, appropriate and easy. He said, what I like best about his days is the certainty. Everything was clear cut. Shaman and his people were the goodies. The Russians were the baddies. The Caucasus belonged to the Muslims. The Tsar's army were the invaders. So, according to the guidelines, how should his response be classified? Did he tick this particular box or not? According to the guidelines, a student who was vulnerable to radicalization would have symptoms of regression, hankering for an idealized past, and misguided belief in authenticity. I still have time. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, the next uh, bit I want to read out is uh, from the past, from the 19th uh, century. And um, w what happens in the 19th century is that um, 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 Imam uh, Shamil's uh, son is is kidnapped by by the Russians, and he's um, for many years, from the age of eight till till he's in his mid twenties. Uh, and so uh, Imam Shamil needs to um, kidnap someone else in order to exchange him, to have a, a, a hostage valuable enough to exchange for his son who had become a, uh, a godson of the, of the Tsar. And uh, so um, what happens is that he kidnaps uh, a Georgian princess, uh, Princess Anna, from her estate in Georgia. Uh, but the part I'm going to read out is um, before Anna is... Um, is uh, kidnapped. So this is her spending the summer in, in her uh, estate. The horseman had seen Alexandra. She could tell by the way he straightened up in his saddle. Anna could breathe more easily now, continue walking towards them, for surely the soldier was bringing a message from David. She was conscious of the fullness of her body in last summer's dress, aware of the absence of Lydia neither inside her nor in her arms, and still it was a surprise. She felt less weighed down, but at the same time incomplete. The distance from the garden to the nursery, where the baby was sleeping, seemed excessively large. If Lydia woke up and cried now, she would not hear her. Her ears, though, strained for that familiar high note, and now it felt as if she was playing truant, exploring the furthest end of the leech that tied her to her daughter. The gardener, Gregov, reached the rider first and turned to bring her the message. Despite the white in his hair, he was strong and quick in his movements. She must ask him why he had delayed cutting the grass. It had not rained yesterday. <coughs> Gregov gripped his hat in one hand and handed her the message. Should he wait for a reply? She hesitated before saying yes. It meant cutting her walk and returning to the house. She preferred writing leisurely long letters in the evening. Now it would have to be a hurried note. Still, David would want her to reassure him. 
Gregor hovered over her as she read the message, his avuncular right, or just a natural eagerness for news from the local militia. David had written, there is no occasion for uneasiness. The sentence was underlined and she read it first, then she went back to the beginning of the letter. She said to Gregor, the fortress at Shildi was attacked by a large num number of lesbians, but they were repulsed and they took heavy losses. Shildi must have been Shamel's target there. He twisted his hat in his hands. My cousin was taken by them as prisoner. They threaded horse hairs through his heels. The lesbians keep their prisoners in pits. In pits, Gerdov continued. What would they know of Christian compassion? Anna turned away from him. Sometimes she felt like she was part of a great char charade, an essential pretense that Russia was winning the Caucasus, that every encounter with Shaman was a resounding victory. And yet thousands of lives were being lost, and the mountains still did not belong to the Tsar. Thank you. And now, Alessandro? I'll try to use this one. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, my book, The Tao, is also a structure as a dual narrative, uh, one set in the um, uh, 16th century and uh, follows the meanderings throughout Europe of um, Giordano Bruno, um, a philosopher, Italian philosopher, a renegade philosopher, persecuted by uh, the Holy Office, the Inquisition. And uh, the part in the present is set in Amman, in Jordan, uh, where there is a digitization project going on. Um, some uh, documents, apparently uh, written by Giordano Bruno, emerge. A, uh, an expert from the Vatican is called in. This expert uh, disappears with some of the papers, so that's the part in the, in the present. The extract I'm going to read is from the Bruno part, we see him um, on Ash Wednesday, 1584. He's in London during his journey through Europe. Um, he has been invited to the house of Falk Greville near uh, Whitehall and to, to hold a disquisition, a disputation. And he's also been invited to dinner. Obviously, being the first day of Lent, this in itself is a piece of heresy. Uh, but he's not worried about that. He has a nightmarish journey through nighttime London, um, but then in the end he comes to the, um, to the, to the house of Falk Greville, uh, where people are still waiting for him. So he enters the room. Giordano let his eyes roam round the room and the table, taking in the scene. The fine wooden carvings and the family portraits on the walls the bright light from wax candles, the glasses full of wine, the silver well besmirched by the, the well-picked bones of beast and fowl. It was all suffused with a dreamlike aura. The potent images of the last few hours were playing against each other in his mind, turning and combining on the mystical wheels of his imagination. Wasn't there a secret correspondence between this night and the journey of his own life? Had he not been dragged away from the safety of his home, from the straight way he was supposed to follow, onto a tortuous, meandering path in the dark? The ancient, creaky boat full of holes, was it not an image of the sinking church of Rome, and those two decrepit, Karen-like boatmen with a pale tallow candlelight of superstitious faith, didn't they resemble St. Peter and the Pope, who had promised to take him to the light as he sang of poetry, and left him instead in a mire of error and sophistry, only fit for monkish swine. Yet he had found a way back to his home, his pure soul. He had thrown away his old clothes, and despite the many dangers and difficulties, the blows delivered by fate and the brutish people around him, he had managed to reach his intended destination, intellectual freedom, the banquet of true minds, the internal sun. A loud burst of laughter made him turn round. He was being observed by the rest of the company. Nundinio, the Oxford doctor sitting in front of him, put his bejeweled hands on the table and cleared his throat. Intelligis domine quidiximus. No. Why were you laughing? 
You don't speak English? I'm afraid not. I've only learned two or three words since I arrived here. And may I ask you why you make no effort to learn our language? Most of the people I want to talk to can speak Latin, French, Spanish or Italian, including your most gracious queen, Ibaudi said. Well, in that case, sir, Nundinho continued, stroking his beard, let me translate for you what caused that mirth. He threw a sidelong glance to Giordano's right, where his learned colleague was sitting. My honoured friend here was telling us a joke that has been circulating among our Oxford students since you abandoned your lectures last year. They say they know why you're so keen to promote Copernicus's opinion that the earth goes round and the heavens stand still. Yes, and why would that be? It's because your own mind never stands still and your head keeps spinning with all those lullian wheels. Very amusing, sir. And we know that Copernicus himself did not believe that the earth moves, as this is clearly impracticable, impossible. If he affirms that it's the earth that moves rather than the eighth sphere, it's only for the ease and convenience of his calculations. Are you telling us that Copernicus' system is only a mathematical or geometric one, bearing no relation to reality? Well, that's what he's stating in his book, in the notice to the reader. You are wrong, sir. You would know that if you had cared to read and understand the author's own words after that notice, which must have been put together by some ignorant, arrogant dunce. Copernicus knew well what he was saying and demonstrated his theory to the best of his ability. Are you suggesting, sir, that we are all wrong, that generations and generations of learned men from different nations have been blinded by error and that only you and Copernicus are right? Many ancient philosophers, as well as some recent ones, the excellent Nicholas of Cusa, for example, held the same opinion. Most of those you call learned men have simply followed what was taught to them with a superstitious faith and a misplaced worship of words, logic, and dialectic. Then perhaps, said Falk Grebel, you will be kind enough to explain to everyone here, in simple terms, why you believe the earth moves. Giordano Baudi said again, I'll be delighted to do so. With wide gestures and a clear voice that carried across the room, he began to expound the main tenets of his new philosophy. The sun was larger than the earth. If the moon were farther away from us, it wouldn't eclipse the sun and would appear less bright to our eyes. Neither the earth nor the sun was at the center of the universe because the universe was infinite and had no center and no boundaries, contrary to what Ptolemies and Master Aristotle had thought. There were innumerable astral bodies in the universe, stars like our sun, worlds such as our earth and the moon, with living creatures on them, each occupying its own place in the boundless expanse of God's creation, each moving with its own speed and trajectory, as if infused with a life, soul and mind of its own. The two doctors kept throwing in questions and interjecting, what is the substance of these bodies? Are they all of the same size? This is pure madness. But this didn't hold the flow of the man from Nola, who seemed to be drawing from an inexhaustible well of knowledge and learning. He spoke with fervor, quoting from the works of ancient philosophers, conjuring daring images, drawing diagrams in the air with his hands, so that even if they did not heed his arguments, they felt its beauty. The Oxford men had fallen silent. Nundinho was gazing at Bruno with the stupefi stupefied stare of someone who had just seen a portent of nature. Who gave this small, contemptible foreigner, this miscreant rejected by his own fault, such assurance, such ardor, such authority? Why was it that his preposterous ideas seemed to make sense on his lips, even the most abstruse formulations and wildest fantasies? The infectious enthusiasm with which he spoke was as dangerous as the evil ideas he professed. It could not be allowed to take root in the minds of Englishmen. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you both. Um, you both chosen to set your uh, novels. Um, there are two narrative strands in your novels. What are the advantages and disadvantages of working in that way? 
Shall I start? <laughs> okay. The um, I think I think the the dual narrative is very. Um, I found it very useful for two reasons. Um, the first one is that um, in the present, I was able to um, to give the reader in an an obtrusive way a lot of information that otherwise in the in the Bruno narrative would have come across as sort of patronizing or sort of telling a lot of information. So um, I was able to. Uh, to build that into the um, into the present more easily, and also the present part for me was a, a kind of intermezzo for the more serious, more heavy, more philosophical, more thoughtful part, which is the Bruno one. So you have the the thriller aspect, the quest on the present, and then you have the sort of uh, semi biographical uh, part of Bruno, and the two things interlink quite well. Okay, Dana. Um. Well, you asked about the downside of having that as well, yeah. I, I thought the, the downside is, of course, that you're interrupting the narrative. I mean, that people are getting into the present, and then suddenly you're taking them away from that, and you're putting them in the past. And you, you worry sometimes that, well, what if they forget that part of the story? Or, you're, or you know, and uh, so it's, it's, it's um, sometimes, you know, having to put in reminders here and there just so that the whole thing flows together and that, that there isn't... Uh, a kind of abrupt uh, movement between the present and the past. But I would imagine that if someone was reading, that this is where they would, uh, finding themselves uh, moving, you know, they're, if they're reading the present and they're moving into the past, that's maybe where they would want to have a break or so, I think, in the reading, yeah. There's also, uh, I think there's also something in both your books about, um, in the past, there's a certainty about about beliefs and about what's going about life in a way that there isn't that certainty in the present day yeah i think the the i think in the past they had the luxury of not knowing about the other parts of the world i mean in the case of imam shaman for example the tribes in the, in the mountains they had no they didn't know what it was like in in, in russia they didn't know the advances uh, that that, that uh, russia had made and one of the things he said when he was the, after he was defeated was that if I, and he was shown, I mean, when he surrendered to the Russians, he was shown Russia. He went around and he was shown the advances of Russia. He, sh he saw the factories, he saw the, you know, the, the, the ships, he, sh he saw things that he would never have seen. And he said, if I had known Russia was, was that strong, I wouldn't have fought against her for 30 years. So people in the past lived within their own communities and they didn't know uh, about the rest of the world, whereas nowadays we, we know what is happening around the world, and so uh, very few people are can be you know smug in their own little world because they they know what is happening elsewhere. It is very true, and uh, this is even more is even truer uh, if we apply this to Giordano Bruno. The times when when Giordano Bruno um, uh, lived, um, in fact, Giordano Bruno. Could be regarded almost as um, as one of the last great medieval men. He came. He probably was born a bit too late. Um, he his formation was definitely that of a of a theologian. Of a, um, he studied dialectics, um, theology, and he studied Thomism. So, um, but he, he was deeply aware that the reality was much more complex than what had been portrayed up to that time and so he was he was desperately trying with his sort of um, intellectual inquiry to come up with answers obviously his answers were wrong the, the 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 right answers would be those of science who invented a language that could explain the nature um, around us but he was still trying to sort out the the great mysteries of the universe as a philosopher and unfortunately you know he failed <laughs> Well, he succeeded, but unfortunately, those around him didn't agree with him. <laughs> he succeeded in a way. I mean, his um, his uh, his works are totally forgotten when it comes to um, you know the philosophy. Their philosophy is is forgotten. It's been superseded. But I think where he survived is as a symbol uh, of someone who um, paid the ultimate price to stand up against oppression, uh, intellectual intolerance, and tyranny. So I think he's an example. 
um, is still very much um, a symbol for the new generations, even in Italy, the anarchic movement, uh, when they do their, 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 their own marches uh, and uh, events, they, they have banners with the name of Giordano Bruno. The, the memory of him as, a, as an anarchic, as a free thinker, is still very much alive. And um, I think there's also something about um, the certainties of religion contrasted to the uncertainties of secularism. For example, in your book, Leila, um, uh, uh, Imam Shamil is, is completely certain about his religion and his identity, whereas his, um, his um, Natasha, the other person, and the other narrator in the book, is very lost really she's she's forgotten that part of her upbringing and feels lost uh, yes because she she um, even though her father is uh, Natasha's father is Sudanese and her mother is Russian and she grew up in, in Sudan uh, both her parents weren't practicing Muslims I mean her father was not a practicing Muslim and she also left uh, Sudan at a young age when she was 14 and she moved to Scotland because her mother um, and got divorced from, from her father and, and she married a Scottish man, so she came here. So, so there is this uh, the complete uh, you know, sort of detachment from Islam, so she didn't you know, grow up as, uh, as, a, as a Muslim. But I think that she uh, she finds that there is something maybe missing in, in her life. And it, it, I actually didn't uh, intend that when I was writing the book. I didn't really intend it to be uh, that she was searching for something. But somehow that, that kind of came, uh, I found it just kind of uh, crept up on me as I, as, I, as I was writing. The fact that it becomes uh, a spiritual uh, journey for her as well. And that she is... Uh, she, she she finally un identifies what it what it is that is troubling her and it and, and she and it is a homesickness she feels a, a kind of a sense of homesickness but but she doesn't know where this home is um, and, and so um, that's that is where the the, the, the voyage is, is is happening yeah and I, I was interested in your book Alessandra that uh, one of the investigators Julia uh, receives a threat written in the Bible, and I thought that was that was interesting because she's not a religious person, and yet she feels very strongly that this threat is is real and scary. Yeah, I wanted to use a lot of um, sort of religious symbolism because the the, the, the book is um, in, in a great part talks about um, religion, even theology. Um, so I wanted to use the image of the Babel Tower, for example, uh, which is very clear, which is not only Christian, but also, you know, it, it, it also circulated in the in Muslim communities, and um, so it's, it's, it's very, very much in, in the background of all of that. Um, I would like to, to say something that I think it is not just a contrast between, you know, sort of uh, the, um, the certainties of religion. I think it's more, it's also about the, the fact that the church and any any power and obviously at that time the church was the biggest power always try to control information con control the truth uh, and this in our secularized um, kind of society is still very much true with the big corporations trying to have a monopoly and a control on the flow of information. So these two things are sort of, you know, what, what I analyze in, the, uh, in this book. Yeah. Um, both of your books took a tremendous amount of research. How long did it take you to research the book? What was, what was the um, ratio between research and writing? Um. A lot, a lot of the time was spent on, on research, and I actually found the writing went very quickly um, once I, I had the research, and uh, um, I had, I, I found um, a new source. I stumbled on it on a, on a new book uh, while I was in the middle of writing. So I remember stopping and, and feeling annoyed that, that that I had to stop in mid flow and, and and have to now examine this new thing that showed up on Amazon when I googled Shamil and I was googling him you know continuously over several years and then this just popped up um, and it wasn't there before 
um, and it was actually a, a good source because it was um, it was at the time written at the time when the, the princesses after the, the 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 kidnapping of the princesses a journalist wrote this account so it was written uh, um, you know on the fact that based on the fact that Shamal was still alive and that the Caucasus was still you know not yet uh, surrendered to to Russia so it was a very good source so I kind of stopped and I had to go back and I had to uh, change many things and oh. add uh, many things yeah but it's 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 wonderful to be. Um, to be so passionate about the subject and to be researching it, I mean, that's it's a very enjoyable uh, process in itself. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, Jonathan Bruno is one of my great passions. I, I probably started reading his works in uh, my early 20s, so I would say it's over 20 years that I've been reading his works. First, the, um, the, his uh, sort of masterpiece is the, the dialogues in Italian. And then uh, recently, thanks to an Italian publisher who published the entire works, Latin works, including those on, uh, on magic. Um, so I, I had to do a lot of reading. It took me years and years to absorb them. Um, and it happened to me too. Uh, I was writing the book. I had to rewrite an entire character <laughs> because a little shred of evidence from the, from the trial in Rome emerged in the last couple of years. And that's quite annoying when it happens, but I was also happy uh, to to be able to include it because probably this is um, probably more accurate than many biographies that are around. You know, I've read lots of biographies that are full of um, uh, misrepresentations of um, of, uh, of Giordano Bruno, whereas I have used only primary sources for my for my for my story. Uh, Leila, I read that you, you're by training, you're a statistician, um, and you said, although newspapers lied horribly, but anyway, in the newspaper it said, in an interview with you, that you visualize your books as a graph. So I wanted to ask both of you how you visualize, <laughs> how you plan your books, how you visualize them before you start writing. Did you say that? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe at the time it seemed a cool thing to say. <laughs> no. um, um, I don't know. You are the first. Well, I, I I studied biology, so I um, I, I see I, I see um, a novel as uh, something uh, organic. So I do want to have an embryonic idea, but then I want it to grow. Uh, and it's DNA, I suppose, if I can use still the metaphor. It's uh, my passion for the subject that is uh, you know very important and um, and also let it grow so I mean I don't want to have every scene already planned out or structured I like to improvise I like to to let it you know grow and sometimes rest and then sometimes you know give it a good airing and um, so you know I I, I, I I take that kind of organic approach <laughs> and you oh, um. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I remember the, when I was doing statistics, I, what I enjoyed most was the modeling. Mm -hmm. And when we did the modeling, it means that we had the data, and the data was, 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 would be scattered, it would be all over the place, and we would then take a model and, and see which model fitted this data best, and then test it to see if this was a good fit or this wasn't a good fit. And this is what we spent time doing again and again before the before computers even which was harder so um so maybe yeah this is maybe this is was a novel does in a way that you're kind of going through uh you're taking the reader through uh, a kind of a smooth um sh something smooth that has that has a shape and and trying to to best fit what is random around it i mean in real life it wasn't one princess that was um, um, taken as, as a captive. It was actually uh, her and her sister and her mother-in-law and her auntie and uh, like five children. So this was would have been very difficult to, to pull off in a, in a novel, the way I write, because I like to go you know, deep into a certain character. So I had to get rid of all these extended family and just have one princess, you know, uh, two children and uh, one uh, governess. Instead of she, I mean, the whole all the servants were kept, was taken yeah. hostages. Yeah, they, they took them all and the cows and the horses and the, they took a lot, the whole estate basically. So it's hard to do that in a novel. So I, I uh, you know, you, you you kind of get rid of. I had to get rid of these things just. 
to, to, to have a, a more smooth ride through the, 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 the whole novel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this isn't the first novel for either of you. Um, and I think your first novel was called The Bookseller? Is bestseller. That right? The Bestseller. Um, and it was It's a satire of the world of publishing. Yeah, so. which is your other My second hat, yeah. Your second hat. And uh, what um, I suppose my question is, how far do you start from an autobiographical, autobiographical beginning when your first book, and how do you proceed from there on? I'm asking impossible questions, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I don't, I, I mean, my, people say my novels are biographical, so I'm like, okay, if you say so. I mean, yeah, because, <laughs> I, I mean, like, my first novel was about a Sudanese uh, woman in, in living in Aberdeen. Okay, I'm a Sudanese woman living in Aberdeen, but, but uh, it's very different. My life was very different. Um, uh, she was a widow, thankfully I wasn't. Uh, so, <laughs> things like that. I mean, there's big differences. Mm -hmm. uh, very very big uh, differences, but uh, but yes, the the raw material comes from the, my experience, my personal experience, and, and and that's what I use in in, in the fiction, and I use the uh, you know all the years I grew up in Sudan and uh, what I what, things I've seen, uh, people I've uh, you know loved, but it's not really purely uh, about uh, autobiographical. I've I've never really. Uh, written uh, something which is very autobiographical. I mean, maybe Lyrics Alley is the closest thing because it was based on uh, my father's cousin, so it, it had a bit of, of you know family history in it. But certainly, this novel is uh, I would probably consider to be the least um, autobiographical of my work. Yeah. Yes, that's what I meant. Yes. Really, you know, whether there's a progression. Yes, yeah. maybe at the beginning you, you, you're full of wanting to get things out of your system, you're, you're mm -hmm. full of your own sort of angst and, and, and uh, well, certainly when I started writing uh, I was homesick and I was, you know, um, uh, trying... Cold, cold? Yes, in Aberdeen, <laughs> you have to be cold, yes. <laughs> and I was cold and I was uh, wanting to, and I was also, I, I was obsessed with the difference between Sudan and Scotland, so I did that a lot in lots of stories, the kind of obsessive comparing between the two places mm -hmm. um, uh, and then you know maybe once I've you know said that then I, I don't need to say it anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the same with me I, the first two novels are uh, probably more strongly autobiographical in the sense that um, I, I, I believe that you can only write about what you know uh, so I wouldn't have felt confident for example to to write the part in a man if I had not lived um, you know, there for some time. If I had not travelled in in, those, in that part of the world for for over ten years, I wouldn't have felt confident writing about it. Um, but um, progressively, I have also um, this is also for me the least uh, autobiographical uh, novel. And the next one I'm writing now will be even further away from my own experience. Well, we've come to that time when it's your turn to ask questions because I've hogged the proceedings so far. So if you have a question, if you could raise your hand. I can... <laughs> this is the roving mic. Um, and if you, I saw a hand going up there, yeah. Hello, thank you for both readings. I really enjoyed the books. Um, my question is, was there ever a point in the writing process where you lost confidence in the novel or you thought that you wouldn't finish it or did you keep the excitement and momentum throughout the writing? Can I? <laughs> it's very relevant to me because I came to 20 pages from the end and I thought I'd never complete it. <laughs> I was about to to call it a day. And then I had an idea, and that idea gave me hope. I worked on it, and and then I managed to salvage it. I had to do a lot of work, but I was very close to giving up. Yeah. Uh, can I just say, I'm, I don't have this mic because of any special reason, otherwise, other than the, my voice is low, so it's not that I'm getting <laughs> special treatment from the Edinburgh Book Festival or anything, <laughs> in case you're wondering. Um, uh, yeah, I moved, I moved countries in, 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 the, in the middle of writing the novel, so I, was, I started writing uh, in Doha, 
Um, and then in the um, around 40% of the way, uh, we moved from Doha to Aberdeen. So uh, I had to put it away because uh, it's, 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 it's very hard work to move, and especially you know, when I had to move my daughter from one school to another, and we, our furniture was in storage, and a lot of disruption like that. So I, I had to stop for about a year before I could um, take up the writing again. So it wasn't to do with the, the, the novel itself, it's, it's just it was to do with the disruption in, in, in my life, yeah. Uh, there's another question there. Put your hand up again. That's it. <laughs> can, can you wait? Can you wait to get to the microphone? That's it. Thank you, Lila. What yeah. I want to ask you is how much are you influenced by writers such as Dostoevsky? Dostoevsky. Um, can I say something else too? Yes. Um, and because he he was a prophetic and he was a critical of the social conditions in Russia in the 19th century, he was a critic of that, and um, his work was prophetic because it later on it produced what was the Bolshevik party and the Russian Revolution in 1905 and 1917, and they had deep roots going back into 19th century Russia and recognising the oppression of Muslims who were an oppressed nationality in Russia and the Caucasus basically, and how much are you influenced and how much is your work related in that way to the social conditions and the political environment that was that, that developed in Russia? Oh. Did, didn't Tolstoy write a book all on the same theme? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Tolstoy wrote the Haji Murad. We were talking about it because uh, yeah, you said I published you, it, yeah. you published it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tolstoy wrote a novel called the Haji Murad. And Haji Murad was actually an um, um, an adverse of uh, first a friend and then and then uh, yeah, yeah an, then an enemy yeah. an enemy of Imam Shamil and Imam Shamil um, felt that he betrayed him and uh, Tolstoy was very much uh, on the side of of um, Haji Murad and against <laughs> Imam Shamil so he there's a there's a kind of negative depiction of uh, Imam Shamil in. Um, in the book, but I found the book very useful, I even though I was I'm pro Shamil and <laughs> anti Haji Murad, <laughs> just for the heck of it, <laughs> because of the descriptions. I mean, it was it was lovely to have uh, a description of the Caucasus at the time uh, and um, of the 19th century and the way because Tolstoy himself has. Um, uh, fought, fought in the Caucasus. He served oh. in the Caucasus, okay. Tolstoy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he wrote about it in the Cossacks. And uh, and so, th t having not been there, it was very, you know, useful for me to write about, uh, to read, and, and you know, to, to imagine it through his words. But you asked about Dostoevsky, and the only time I mentioned, you know, I, 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 I say that it, I bring up Dostoevsky as an influence is when some people say that. Um, uh, I've heard uh, some writers say that all authors are, are secular. No author has ever had faith. And I always then bring up Dostoevsky as an example of because he was, you know, he was a committed uh, Christian. And, um, and so I, I, you know, use him an, uh, as an example. There's another question here. Can you tell me if there's a good book in English on on Bruno? Because I have one that's horrible. I can't understand. <laughs> it's not understandable. I'm the gift of knowing Italian, so I couldn't go there. Do yeah. you know of any good, decent? Uh, if, you, if you want to uh, know about Bruno, probably your best bet is um, uh, Francis A. Yates' um, book on Bruno, The Art of Memory. Uh, which was one of my main inspiration um, to start writing this book. Um, it was a starting point for me. Um, so that's a very, very good book. It's still very much in print. It's a classic of its genre. Uh, it's much more than about Bruno. It's about the history of the art of um, memory from ancient times through to uh, Middle Ages. So, you know, even Lul and... Um, and then he, he, he sort of majors on, on Bruno. There's been um, a lack of interest in Bruno, unfortunately. There was a, a, a biography, I think, a couple of years ago in America, but it's not very good, not very good. The, the ones in Italy, um, they're full of legends. So there are, the, you know, the, the, you can't, the, 
all you have to do is to get the original papers and make, make up your mind. The, the best ones are the ones in the 30s and 40s, um, especially one in the 40s. Um, I don't remember the name of the... Um, there's this one which is unreadable because it's like 900 pages long and it's too full of documents but the one in the 40s unfortunately is written by someone who had an agenda because he was he was a monsignore so you know that that's why i think with bruno the best books for me were the the documents of his trials reading those they are in italian so i i could read them fortunately they're not translated into english but the Oh, they, they are every, yeah, they are now widely available. Yes, so uh, but th that so the moral of the tale is learn Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Um, it's a question perhaps for Leila Adelaida. Your novels you deal with very different subjects, sometimes like the lyric alley with FGM in the. the Presently, in the kindness of enemies, you're presenting a, a rather horrifying picture of um, what's happening to modern universities. Is that with the um, staff uh, spying on their students, uh, giving reports and shading the reports to you? You um, give a good example of how just altering a few words in the description of someone's uh, uh, what someone has said, how you can make it seem much more sinister. Do you see your, your novels as having a, uh, a political purpose in drawing attention to some of the uh, less pleasant aspects of life? Well, I guess I've, I, I, cho I choose to write about these subjects because they disturb me, they scare me. They, they, I'm, I'm frightened of, of, of these things. Um, so I write, I write about them. Uh, not necessarily... I. I I don't really feel I can change anything. I don't really have that much confidence in myself or that anyone who matters is going to listen or read what I'm writing. So um, it's just my own uh, fear, fears. And because I get so disturbed, I, I, I choose to, to write about it. Um, so I suppose, yes, it is, it is, it is political in that, in, that, in that sense. But I'm not. I'm not an. I'm not an activist. I mean, I'm not someone who is really out to to to, to change uh, things. Um, but perhaps if it might, um, if people might read it and, and and make up their own minds or or or, or you know, see how it uh, feels to them. So I suppose. So. <laughs> Any more questions? No. Who are writing in what's um, not for the, in the language that's not of your country of origin? And I wondered if you know you're here in Scotland promoting your books, but I wondered if you went back to your countries of origin and promoted your books there, and whether they've been translated into other languages. But then I wondered also if the reception of them is different from the reception you get here. Yeah, all my books have been uh, translated into Arabic, and when they're translated into Arabic, I work very closely with, uh, with the Arabic translator, because, um, I mean, Arabic is my first language, and uh, um, I read Arabic uh, fluently, but when it comes to writing, because I was educated in English, and I read most of the time in English, so therefore my English is, is stronger, but still, I, I can read cr critically in Arabic. So I do work with uh, the, the, the translators, um, uh, the reception is different, uh, is, is very much different in Sudan as it, than it is uh, here. For example, um, uh, to take the example of, of Lyrics Ali, which was just mentioned, for example, as, uh, as having F, uh, uh, an episode of FGM in it. Uh, this would be something I would be asked about here. I was asked about it on Women's Hour, for example, on the radio. When I went to Sudan to promote the book, this was never mentioned at all. Uh, it's a taboo subject, so nobody's going to everybody's just going to pretend that it's not there. I mean, it's there in the novel and people are reading it, but, uh, you know, w people wouldn't uh, feel comfortable talking to me about it in an, in an interview, for example. They concentrated more on uh, other aspects of the novel, for example, because it was about uh, uh, my father's uh, cousin who um, wrote songs. So they were interested in the, p in the, in the, in the, in the songs, in the, in the history, uh, much more than than here, they were interested in the characters. So it's um, it's a, it's received uh, differently. Yeah. 
Yeah, my my book is also being translated into a few languages, um, um, Spanish, German, Czech, and others, but uh, not into Italian. So uh, <laughs> partly partly by choice. <laughs> Um, because I'm also a translator, so I would have to rewrite them myself, probably in Italian. Um, however, this may be my swan song, because the next novel I'm writing, I'm writing in Italian. So we will see. Then I will have to submit it to a publisher in Italy, and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh, here's one here. I was just prompted by that. Is this one? Yes. Um, that, uh, thinking about that and thinking about Jordan Bruno's voice, would it have come easier? I couldn't have done it. That's the reason I wrote it in English. <laughs> because I, I, I have a problem with historical novels, because it's something that is too remote from us. So one thing I had to use primary sources, and I had to really try to to feel his voice, and I can see his voice even through the in the, in the minutes of the trials in in Venice, you could hear his voice, his words. You can you can see the language, and so for me it was easier in a way to translate it into English. It's almost those parts um, an act of translation more than writing. Um, obviously, they were written in a boring sort of minutes way but so I had to create dialogue and so on and so forth but uh, but I have to reimagine how he would have sounded and um, the distance of time and language I uh, would have made it impossible for me to do it in Italian because it, I would have created a pastiche and I would have been unhappy <laughs> that that reminds me of um, I chaired an event with a husband and wife team I'm sure you're going to know who who I mean, who wrote a book. Um, I know uh, them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And their book was banned by the Vatican. And yes, I know. Yeah, yeah they, they called me from Switzerland, wherever they live, and they want us to publish his, his works, but they're rubbish. They're <laughs> total rubbish. It's, it's a total pastiche. So basically, 20th century and 14th century all together on the same page. For me, that is not an historical, you know. Maybe in translation, you can do something. Because, for example, the, the, the Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco is pretty much the same. There's uh, on the very first page, I tried many times to read it. <laughs> and I've always stopped after the 10th page because um, I think I have a problem with the language he uses in Italian. However, the English translation is, is pretty good. And I think you can do in translation, it can be a good medium, you can sort of sort out the problem of uh, creating a credible, plausible language for the reader. But I suppose my point was would, do you think that you might, your book might be? Um, discouraged by the Vatican? Well, I I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I was invited by the Nuncio Apostolico uh, after writing this book and uh, he knew that I had written it and he didn't say anything. I don't think they see Giordano Bruno as a very dangerous man. Um, the fact that, his, uh, that the papers of his trial have gone lost, actually, um, just Test demonstrates that he was not seen as a great problem. When they, uh, the, you know, all the Napoleon took all the papers from the Biblioteca Vaticana to France because he was creating a centralized archive for his empire, and obviously immediately the the Pope sent some envoys trying to to retrieve as much as possible. And they said, you know, even if you can't retrieve everything, try at least to get the Galileo trial and some other trials, another eight or nine, but Bruno's trials papers were not important to them because the real, I think the real challenge and the real danger for, 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 uh, for the Church of Rome is science more than philosophy. Mm. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, this has to be a very quick yes, question. It was just following on from the stuff about translation. Can, can you just wait for the microphone? Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much. Really enjoyed that. It's just a quick question about translations. I, I, I'm sure you've both waded through some translation theory, and I just wondered, in, in the translations of your books, are you more interested in concepts of, for example, fidelity as in you know, trying to replicate sense, or more of a kind of a foreignizing strategy that might capture a certain, certain regularities of language? Each book is different. 
I would take um, a one by one approach. And I have to say that when I started Hesperus Press now 14 years ago, I was very much for literal translation. And that evolved into more, I wouldn't say free and easy, but I think readability has become more and more important for me. And we do about 60% of our books are translations, and I'm heavily involved with our translators. And I, I sort of give the blessing, you know, I see a sample, and uh, it has to read well, it has to interest the reader, because otherwise, yes. you know, who cares? <laughs> Yeah, sometimes I've, um, when I'm writing, the, the, the characters are speaking Arabic, and so I am translating them into English when I write. So therefore, when, they, they, when, the, when the text goes back into Arabic, I want it to sound like how they spoke originally. So I feel very strongly that, you know, this is what they said, or this is not what they, they said. So, I, um, so this is why I work with the, transla with the translator on that, because... Uh, um, and I've been horrified at times when um, I've had, I've translated things in Arabic into English and then the Arabic translator then does, then translates it back into Arabic. No, he, tra he translates it back into Arabic, whereas he should go to the source because this is actually was written by someone else in Arabic, you see, and I'm the one who translated it. So, um, so that has, that I feel of course very strongly about that. So, um, but that, maybe that answers your question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for today. But uh, please join with me in thanking uh, Alessandro and Leila very much for a fascinating hour. They will be signing copies of their books in the bookshop over the, uh, the bookshop with the neon sign. I used to say adult bookshop, but then somebody pointed out <laughs> to me. <laughs> so if you go um, at the diagonal on the site, you'll find the, the bookshop. Um, which is for adult books. No, that's wrong. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much to both of you. <laughs>